to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. You may be seated. Each of the weeks of Lent, we gather in these midweek services and we focus on different parts of the story of the last week of Jesus' life uh, before he goes to that cross and is buried and rises again on the third day. And uh, last week we looked at the call of return to prayer, those moments when the disciples were in the garden and they could not stay awake and pray with the Lord Jesus. But we hear the invitation to return to prayer knowing that even Jesus then continued in prayer for those disciples. Today our theme is return from betrayal. And here we will find that God urges us to be true to him. And when we fall, even still, he intercedes to provide blessings for his people. Each of the readings we have for tonight focus on a point of betrayal. Our Psalm 41 that we had includes the line that David says that even my close friend in whom I trusted who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. A connection to Psalm 41 where Jesus speaks those words is our Old Testament reading from 2 Samuel where we had a portion from chapter 15 and a portion from chapter 17. This part of 2 Samuel is looking at the increasing conspiracy that Absalom builds to try to overthrow his father David. And in our text we hear about Absalom but then we find that Absalom sends for Ahithophel, the Gilanite. This was David's closest advisor, who many, when they read Psalm 41, is the one whom they think David is talking about when he says, Even my close friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, now lifts his heel against me. Ahithophel builds in the the conspiracy, uh, feeding the weakness of Absalom, telling Absalom that he can gather 12,000 men and go in battle against his father David, and they'll, they'll surprise David, they'll overtake David. And then he says, when you seek the life of only one man, all the people will be at peace. And in this text, this point of betrayal, we find in Ahithophel what he thinks are these devious law words that I almost think that should come with a, a, you know, one of those maniacal laughs that just are a thing of uh, caricature. But in fact, he's speaking words that are found in the gospel. That we, in seeking the life of only one man, calling for Jesus to be on that cross and set a Barabbas to be released, seeking the life of that one, we find that all the people do have the opportunity to be at peace. The story of Absalom and, and David ends terribly. Absalom dies, and it grieves David terribly. He even is upset with the one that would dare to deliver him the news of his son's death. Our second reading looks at Acts chapter 3. This is after Jesus has died been in the tomb for three days, risen again, spoken to his disciples for 40 days, rising on Ascension Day. They wait for 10 days, the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit comes upon them. And now, just days after that, Peter is speaking words of condemnation to the people in Jerusalem, telling them that they have denied the Holy and Righteous One. They asked for a murderer to be granted instead of the author of life. Jesus died because they wanted a murderer to be released instead of him. Peter is reminding them of their betrayal, that God had provided his own son, and they had betrayed this mission by handing him over to Pilate. It's, it's a difficult thing for them to hear, and if Peter were to finish his sermon just with this point of condemnation, it would appear that there is no return from betrayal. The law does that. It gets us to a spot where we will think that's the case, where we will find ourselves condemned, our sin ever before us, 
and we will find ourselves far away from God, and a return from that dark spot seems hard. And so if Peter had left his message on this day in Acts chapter 3 to the people in the temple under Solomon's portico with just those words of betrayal, they would be left in death. But then he tells them, and his name, by faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know, and the faith that is through Jesus has given this man perfect health in the presence of all. And now, brothers, I know you acted in ignorance, as did all of your rulers. But what God foretold by the mouth of the prophets that Christ would suffer, he has fulfilled. And now here we get to this point of pivot, where we realize that the acknowledgement that we have betrayed God with our sin Because really, that's what every sin is. It's a betrayal of the relationship we have with our Heavenly Father. We are to be His children. He is to be our Father. But when we sin, when we push back against His commandments, we are betraying the very covenant that He has made with us. That I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, that has rescued you out of Egypt. Be this kind of people for me. And then he gives them the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20. And whenever we sin, whenever we break those Ten Commandments, we are betraying this covenant relationship God seeks to have with us. But then, as I was thinking about betrayal and how to describe it, I realized one of the things that makes betrayal so so much of a a pain in the chest when we realize we've done it, is betrayal is something that only can happen between friends, between people who have a relationship where trust has been built or where trust is expected. Betrayal takes a relationship that exists and destroys it. To someone you have no relationship to, you can't betray them. There's no trust. There's no relationship. Betrayal is not possible. As Peter is describing to them their betrayal of the Holy and Righteous One, the author of life, he is reminding them that God had wanted to have a relationship with them. He had sent the author of life to write their story again for them. And to this relationship that we see destroyed, where Peter makes it clear it's destroyed, Peter then says, Repent, therefore, and turn again, that your sins may be blotted out. It's as if he was echoing the words of Joel chapter 2, verse 13. Return to the Lord, for he is gracious and merciful. Betrayal is something that we see in Absalom and Ithophel. We see it as Peter speaks to the people of Jerusalem gathered under Solomon's portico. But there's probably no other name that is marked by betrayal besides Judas Iscariot. Maybe in U.S. history we got Benedict Arnold and and, and then of course we got Julius Caesar and Brutus et tu Brute. But I think Judas, he kind of caps them all with what he does. It's premeditated. It's planned. He's met with the chief priests. He's received the 30 pieces of silver. He takes them to a quiet spot because in many other spots the chief priests had wanted to arrest Jesus, but they were afraid of the crowds. Judas knows that quiet spot. In our criminal system, we will often have a greater punishment for crimes that are premeditated, that are planned, versus a crime of passion. Judas has premeditated this betrayal, gathering the soldiers for that appointed arrival in the garden, and it, it, I suppose on this side of the story, we may want to make the leap that Judas was just an innocent puppet in God's plan, that Judas was without choice. He was preordained to be the one that would betray the Lord. And, and really, then I suppose there's supposed to be some sympathy for him. But, but I want you to see that in this story of betrayal, the Certainly Judas is one that has premeditated this moment, but there's one whose premeditation is older than this betrayal of Judas, and that is Jesus. 
He has been ordained from, be, from the very foundations of the world to save you and me. And when Jesus is born, this author of life, as he becomes flesh and he dwells in this world, he is arriving into a world where he knows the kind of choices people make. Jesus understands that with our reason and with our strength, we will be hostile to God. Jesus knew exactly what he was doing when he arrived in that garden. Indeed, he prays to his heavenly Father, asking that this cup could pass from him. But it doesn't. Because, you see, Judas's premeditation, Judas's choice to do this betrayal, it's a magnifying glass in all of us in our need for a Savior. Judas was going to sin. Because he, in his reason, and his strength of spirit, he could do no other than sin. And we may want to think on this side of the story that we would be without sin, but the Gospel accounts, all four of them make it clear that all of the disciples have their faults and their reasons why they needed Jesus. There's not one person in the Bible besides Jesus that lived in such a way that they could say, Jesus, I'm glad you came for them. I'm fine. But no, every single one of us, when we look to our hearts and examine our lives, we'll find there's that moment when we have betrayed the commandments of God and that relationship he desires to have with us. And in that moment, we may think our betrayal is worse of all. We may color that moment of darkness with... Uh, the charcoal of darkness that think there's no way to see me anymore, Lord, with what I've done. But when we see that the Lord knew what Judas was going to do, and still he went to the garden. When we see that Jesus knew what Peter was going to do, and he still was led to Caiaphas' house. When we see that what those soldiers would do as they mocked and beat him, and he still went to the cross. When Jesus knew all of that and still went to the cross, I want you to know that he knows exactly your sin. Those moments of betrayal when you have broken the covenant that he has made with you. And still, he was born of the flesh, lived in this world, suffered, died. And he is the one that rose again for you. So yes, we know betrayal. And we, it's, it's the sin that hurts the most when a friend breaks us like that. Or when we when we break a relationship in that way. But I want you to know God knows you. And still, he sent Jesus to be your Savior. And so as Joel said, yet it is not too late. Return to the Lord, for he is gracious and merciful. May that be the peace and comfort that brings to you or to anyone you know that thinks their sin has brought them too far from the mercies of God. Jesus got right into your sins. He got right on the cross for you. Amen. Will you please stand?